All right, well, good morning, church. So great to see you this morning. Let's go ahead and stand up together. So we worship. We have our kids in here this morning. It's going to be awesome this morning. Who can stop? And who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 And who can stop the Lord? Stop him, and who can stop the Lord Almighty? And who can stop the Lord? Hey. Hey. Our God is the lion, the lion of Judah, who's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Prosper 
When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Sing that truth out. That my God will never fail. And I will see a victory. And I will see a victory for the best.
because in your name, God, in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. We know how this story ends. Father, we know how this story ends. We know, God, you are victorious, Father. So therefore, in any battle, in any circumstance, in any doctor's report, in, in any news we may hear on the phone, in any conversation, God, we know, God, because of who you are, because of what you've done, we believe. And then we sing that there will be a victory. Believing in faith, God, because that's who you are, a miracle worker. You're powerful. You're wonderful, God. Wonderful God. You're worthy of our praise, God. Father, you're so worthy of our praise, God. You're so worthy, God. Church, we could take a seat this morning. I was just so captivated in that song, I almost lost my spot, but to, to see. Our kids, so our kids, every month they learn a worship song and they come in with us and worship with us and they do signs, signs and I was doing that to Victory, that's good. And just to see, the, and this is a really, some, some, someday you all should just like kind of come up and see like people worship. It's really, really humbling. Seriously, super humbling. And to see these kids singing this truth out that I'm going to see a victory and the innocence of that. Because there's nothing, I shouldn't say nothing. Their life experiences isn't nearly as much as some of us and the battles that we've had to face. But the truth and the, and the beauty that Jesus said, have the, have the heart of this child. To worship with that, just reckless. Like, I, I don't care what anyone thinks about me. I'm just going to sing this song and do this. I'm going to smile. I'm going to jump. I'm going to dance. Because worship is an expression expression of praise giving back to our God who gave it all. And an awesome time, a moment now that we get to express our love and our remembrance for who God is, what God's done. Is that we take of communion we remember the sacrifice that Jesus paid for us, that because of his death, because of his resurrection we have life. That we can see a victory because our God's victorious. Amen? Amen. So let's pray and invite the ushers to come forward and partake of communion. Uh, the plates will be passed by and just go ahead and take it as you feel led to. But let's pray. So if God, we just give you all the glory, all the honor. God, remember, Father, the sacrifice that you paid for us, the ultimate price, God, and that because of you, because you live, we can see tomorrow. So I just pray for humbleness as, as we as we take of this time to to just lay it all before you lay it all before you God to repent to confess God knowing that you are alive and because you're alive we have life we praise you God praise in Jesus name amen
Sing that chorus. And I surrender all. I surrender all. All to Thee, my blessed Savior. I Sing it again, sing it again. Singing, I surrender all. Yeah, I surrender all. We give it to you, God. All to thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender. think of you next to you or in front of you or behind you. Just have this be a moment with you and the Lord as we remember the beautiful name, the wonderful name of Jesus. I just invite you to lift your hand and surrender. Close your eyes and kneel, whatever it is. Death could not remember him this morning.
surrender all to you. We give the glory to the honor. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church. So glad you're here. Turn to someone next to you. Give them a high five, a fist bump. Tell them you like their hair and take a seat. Hey church, hello, I promise my mic is on, how are you all? My name is Matt, if you are visiting with us today, welcome, we'd love to know a little more about you, there are some cards in the seat back in front of you, if you'd be willing to fill that out and stick it in the offering plate here in just a second that we're going to pass. Um, I am responsible for life groups here at the church. One of my, the things that I do, if I uh, just want to put a plug in for life groups, if you are interested in getting involved with a life group or small group, we call them life groups, um, you can see me after church. Um, I'd love to hook you up with a life group. Also, how many are wearing your blue band today? Put them up. Yes, this really cool piece of jewelry. If you want to be one of the cool kids and wear one of these, you can see me after church as well. Um, in our midweek services, um, I'm teaching a class on prayer, and we're focusing on prayer for the next couple months. So even if you're not in the class, but you would like to focus on prayer in your life and you want a little reminder, I've got plenty of these. So see me after church, and I will hook you up with a blue band. Um, let's pray for the offering. Father, um, we say it every week. We need to say it every day, all the time. Father, we are so blessed, and it's because of you. Um, thank you for... Um, for what we have, Father, may it never get in the way of our relationship with you. We want to put you first. And one of the ways we do that, Father, is by giving back to you some of what you've given us. So we do that now. We pray that you, we, I pray that you bless it, Father. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, my name is Marissa. Welcome to Cedar Creek Church, and this is the update. <laughs> time of year again when we are sending out 2019 giving statements. Please be sure to update your email in the Church Center app or email info at cedarcreekchurch.com for your update. This past Wednesday, we launched our midweek workshops here at Cedar Creek. These will continue through March 25th, and we would love to have you join us on Wednesday nights as we gather together to grow in our faith and in community. Men's Retreat is this weekend, and it's taking place Friday and Saturday at Lake James Christian Camp in Angola. This event's open for all men, grades nine and up. It's gonna be an awesome time of fellowship, worship, a guest speaker, games, gym time, food, and a bacon bar. There are flyers in the commons and you can find out more information and register for the event online at our website. Mark your calendars for next Sunday, February 2nd for our Youth Ministries annual tailgate party for the entire church. This event begins at 12 p.m. and there's no cost for this event and no need to sign up, just come. If you're planning on coming, we would love it if you could bring a side dish to share with everyone. We'll provide a ton of food also, including many of your favorite tailgate party foods, and we hope you can join us. Ladies, we are so excited to host IF Gathering here at Cedar Creek on February 7th and 8th. It's a women's gathering that exists to equip, 
and unleash a generation with the power, mercy, and grace of our Savior, Jesus Christ. This event is a game changer to jumpstart your year with focus and intentionality, and it's for all women grades nine and up. Registration is open online, and I hope you can come for an awesome weekend of this. You can view today's message notes on the YouVersion Bible app. And for all other events and information, you can visit us online at cedarcreekchurch.com. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram to stay up to date on all things Cedar Creek. And this has been your Cedar Creek Update. Mark your calendars for next Sunday. Ugh. Do you ever have mornings like that? You just wish you could reset and start over. So how's the new year been so far? Good? Good. You're here, right? That's, that's part of the victory right there. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Greg Kraft, and I'm the lead minister here at Cedar Creek. And thank you for worshiping with us. Thank you for spending some time worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus, with us. We're wrapping up a series called Reset Today. And we're focusing on purpose, and there's an interesting study that was put out several years ago, and it was given to students, 18 to 25, college-age students. And the question was, make sure you have your purpose over your paycheck. And part of adulting was this, you adult better when you have a purpose, when you have a clear idea of what your purpose is. Over 80% of the students that were surveyed said that is important. But as they got a little deeper into it, only about 40% had any idea of what their purpose might be, and 30% didn't even know why they were here. Now, the author of this study said this. She goes, this isn't good news for us. She says, coasting is existing, not thriving. The majority of young adults who say they don't have a clear picture of what they want in life also says that they are existing and not thriving. While those with purpose more often say that they are thriving. And I, I kind of want to throw out that 18 to 24-year-old and say it's all of us, isn't it? If we know what our purpose is, it helps us align with what we're doing. How often do we find that we're just drifting? We're just checking off another day, another year on the calendar. We're just, and before you know it, you're down, you're down the road. You're 57 years old. You're not sure why you're here. You're not sure what your purpose is. You're not sure what you're doing and why you're doing it. It's interesting when you look at the dictionary about what purpose means, it says this. The noun part of purpose, the reason for which something is done or created or for what it was made or why it exists. So your purpose is why you were created. It's already taken care of. Why you exist, like Cedar Creek exists to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. And as believers in Jesus, our purpose is already taken care of. It's just we don't often lean into it. So first we looked at resetting to our mission. What has Cedar Creek been called to do? And in our mission statement, leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus, there's some form of that in most churches. Most churches are called to some form of the Great Commission, to be disciples of Jesus and to share the good news. 
but also there is the vision. What is it for us specifically? What, what, what will we do? What has God called us to do? To be united as one body. Overcome by one God. Building one kingdom, one life at a time. That's something we all can do. We all can be part of that. But what is our purpose? What is individual, for us individual, what is our purpose? I'm going to look at two texts today that are texts that we've looked at many, many times. The Great Commandments and the Great Commission. So you can open up version or however you access your scriptures. Or Bible still works, by the way, folks. If you have one of those, they still work. Yes, absolutely. But the Great Commandments is found in a couple of the Gospels. And I, and I just love this because it takes all this stuff that we think is so complicated and it boils it down to what really matters. Basically, when Jesus is asked by a teacher, so what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus says... Well, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. It's to love your neighbor as yourself. That is the great commandments. But I'm going to go ahead and read it exactly how it says in the scripture. Verse 28 of Mark 12 says this. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Now, in the temple courts, Pharisees, Teachers of the law, they love to debate about what the most important thing is. They just like to talk in circles. A little bit like philosophy at times. They, they don't get anywhere, but they make great time. So they're just talking in circles. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is most important? The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. That is all of it. We don't hold any back. We are overcome by God and his goodness. We are overcome by the Holy Spirit. And we worship him. We love him with everything. We have all of it. And the second one is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now that really does seem pretty simple, doesn't it? Seems like church should be about five minutes. We just need to love God with all our heart, everything we have, and love our neighbors. But then what does the question become? So who is my neighbor? Well, of course, it's people who think and act and like what I like, right? Do what I do. Those are my neighbors. See, here's the big thing for us. In matters of faith, people will not be drawn to our way of thinking if it does not match our way of life. People will not be drawn to our way of thinking if it does not match our way of life. Now, that seems like a big leap from the text I just read, doesn't it? But really, it's not. If we love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, will we do what he says to do? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands, right? My commands are not burdensome. In the Old Testament, God says we have blessings and curses. Follow this way, you'll have blessings. Follow this way, you'll have curses. Life will be tough. If you follow this way, life will be easier. There's a real common thread all the way through the scriptures on what Jesus wants of us. But when what we say doesn't match how we live, it looks phony. And people can smell that a mile away. And we are a very jaded cynical, untrusting world. I think we've always been that way. I think within human beings, there is a, a protective nature that pops up. We look at what's wrong first. We're very cautious. Whatever's negative seems to come to the forefront first. So you take that and multiply it by constant media, constant opportunity to see what's broken and see what's wrong and see what the spin is. And I'm to believe that Really, I love the way your words do this, but your life doesn't match. So when that happens, your words mean nothing. Believer, when we behave badly, God gets the blame. It's just the way it works. I wish it wasn't, but it's true. So when we do this, we, I think we have to do it in this order. Have you ever tried to love your neighbor as yourself without loving God first? Mm, that's tough. Because we get in the way. It's about what we want. It's about our lens. But if we truly are overcome by what God wants for us, and we let him 
direct our steps. And it's not easy. It just isn't. It isn't. But if we really can surrender and have our, our will tamed, overwhelmed, and let his goodness prevail with us and his Holy Spirit have control of us, I do believe we can love him with everything we have. And when we do that, that second command becomes much easier. I didn't say it's going to be easy. It just becomes much easier. Because people still have free will. I don't know about you, but I think I have sharp edges. And when I bump into people, I can hurt them. I, I didn't know that. But you know what? They have sharp edges too. You have sharp edges. We don't think we do, but we do. But surrendering our life to God makes all the difference. So in our matters of faith, having the right position, having the right understanding of this doctrine, having the right whatever, if it doesn't match our life, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So our purpose is, tying this back to purpose, is to keep things in order. Love the Lord your God first. Then you can love your neighbor. So let's go to the second text I want to talk about. How about the Great Commission? Matthew 28. 28, 16 through 20, it says this, Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Isn't that interesting? All this time with Jesus, right before he ascends, right before he leaves, he's been resurrected, he's walked with them. All these miracles, and some still doubt. Then Jesus came to them and said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Go make disciples. Go love your neighbor. After you've been, after you completely love me, go love your neighbor. Teach them, disciple them. Baptize them. Teach them. Is the Holy Spirit calls to mind everything I have taught you? Teach them. Teach them everything I have commanded you. And I think the word command sometimes trips us up. We think command is always some harsh thing. It's not. If it's a loving father who has the best intentions for your life and he tells you to do something, does that come across as negative? It shouldn't. It's a command, but it's for our good. There are laws we follow because it's for our good today. And we're glad they're there. So these commands are not burdensome. But see, our living out the great commission, the great commandments gives us authority and credibility to set into the great commission. Our living out the great commandments gives us authority and credibility to set, to step, to set into this thing, to say, this is where I'm going to park this great commission. This is where I'm going to be. I have authority in this because I've done this, because I've already taken care of the greatest commandments. I'm loving the Lord with all I have. I'm loving my neighbors. And now with that, I have authority through Christ to speak to others, to disciple, to teach, to baptize, to have some influence in their life. You know, if you follow our movement back far enough, we were Presbyterian, okay? And the Presbyterians had a catechism. It's called the Westminster Catechism. And really part of that is what is the duty of man? And the duty of man is this, is to bring glory to God and enjoy him forever. I love that, don't you? What is our job? To bring glory to God and to enjoy him forever. Do you think enjoying God is good for your witness? Do you think enjoying God helps match up our faith and our life? I do. It's what makes the difference. It is enjoying him, bringing him glory and enjoying him. You know, one of our core values is pursuing spiritual transformation. Why do we do that? Why is that so vitally important? Because what it does is this, is we pursue spiritual transformation, constantly being formed into the image of Jesus. It brings glory to God and it's good for our life but it's also for the sake of others. And that fits with the great commandments, loving God, loving others. And it also fits with the great commission. 
These are two bookends of what our purpose is. And I think when we fight against that, we get lost. I don't know about you, but I've spent a lot of years trying to find my purpose or fulfill it with something else. And there's a lot of things in this world that satisfy for the short term. You know, the now shouts pretty long, but the later lasts longer. Now's pretty powerful, but the later lasts longer. It's easy to be drawn into that. Author um, John Piper says, part of what God's purpose is for us is to just glorify him and loving him. That's it. That's it. Sometimes we think our biggest purpose is to evangelize, and I think that's important that we do that. But if we're loving God and we're loving our neighbor, is evangelism happening? It's not something that we go do. It's something that we are. Oh, time to go evangelize. I have the right words. I have the five-finger exercise. I've got the right words to say. And you had this. Oh, no, that wasn't right. This is what's right. You, well, we'll pray for your grandma because she was wrong. But then we go down this list. No. For many churches, there's no higher aim than to bring others to the Lord. And I think that's important. But I'm wondering if we've got that a little out of balance. If we truly are overcome by God and his goodness and we love others, that one will take care of itself. We don't have to add that one. That one's in the mix. That one's taken care of. Author Tim Chalice says this. He said, a church that does not care to evangelize cannot be a healthy church. And likewise, a Christian who never shares his faith is in all likelihood spiritually ill. But he would go on to say that evangelism is a privilege and an honor, but it's not the highest calling. It's to love God and to love others. And that one takes care of itself. You know, if you have a child... And there's developmental stages in, in child, <laughs> in child, thank you. For those of you at home, I need this, by the way. And there's developmental issues in stages of child's growth. We got a puppy. His name's Oakley. He's three times as big as he was a couple months ago. Now, if we had Oakley and he did not grow, we would be concerned, right? We would take him to the vet. Interesting, uh, WebMD gives these areas for parents to look at if you think your child is not developing like it should. And these are some areas. It says there are many different types of development delays in infants and young children. They include problems with language or speech, vision, movement, social and emotional skills, and thinking. I wonder if God got on WebMD and looked at us. What would he say? Seriously, with his, with his people, what would he say? Goes on to say, sometimes the delay occurs in many or all of these areas. When that happens, it's called global development delay. Do you think we have a global developmental delay as a body, as Christians in general? Is that possible that that happens? How is our language, our speech, is it wholesome, is it edifying, is it uplifting? How's our vision? So what's the future? I hope they have good snacks on Sunday. So what's the movement? How are we, how are we moving? What's going on? How's our social and emotional skills? Are we engaging the culture? Are we engaging our neighbors? How about our thinking? Is it all now thinking or is it kingdom thinking and these are questions I ask myself because if I had a child that was in that situation I would be finding help I would be looking at how we can correct this I would do whatever it took to find out how to fix this and what's going on and I wonder if God is the same way but he's got a prescription for us 
He's got a way for us to figure this out. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes these words. Starting with verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Folks, you know there has been kindness shown to us by Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Do you notice it doesn't say it is a gift of God. It is the gift of God. Not by work so that no one can boast, for we are God's handiwork. What are we, what are we, why are we his handiwork? What does this fit with purpose? Created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Purpose. What we are created to do, and we're all created differently. Without you, the kingdom is not what it could be. Without us stepping into loving God and loving our neighbors like we should, the kingdom's missing out on your gifts, how you're wired, your experiences. You know, we all, sometimes we think we're too broken to be of any value. What do I have to offer? Look at my life. This sounds kind of cliche, but I think it's true. I do believe that God doesn't waste a hurt. Part of your story, where it intersects with his story, can help change someone else's story. Your life skills, whatever's happened in your life, your experiences, your journey, gives you things in your toolbox that you can speak to someone in a situation where others can't. That's part of what your purpose is. I believe that's what God has called us to do. There'll be things we can step into that others can't because of what he has purposed us to do. These good works he's created us to do. Do we believe that nothing sneaks by him? Do you think God's up there going, gosh, Greg, I didn't know that happened. How, when did that happen? He's not doing that with any of us. His heart hurts when things happen to us. That wasn't his plan for us. Sin was not his plan. The brokenness, the things that trap us and trip us up and cause us to limp through this world with no hope, with no victory, that's not of God. But we have free will. And he keeps picking us up when we fall, saying, you know what, I love you, come here. Let's try it again. Now remember what I said. It's like riding a bike. He sticks us back on, and he runs alongside us, he pushes us, and we wreck. But he runs over there to us, picks us up, wipes our eyes, sticks us back on, says, you can do it, you can do it. And he pushes us again until we start to get it. That's how the Heavenly Father loves us. I want you to ride. I want you to have the victory. I want you to fulfill your purpose. I've made you this way. And that's what he wants us to do, is step into that. But sometimes we try to fill our purposes with other things, don't we? Interesting research on people who win gold medals and people who win silver medals and people who win bronze medals. The, people, the person who wins the bronze is more satisfied than the one who wins the silver. Because the silver medalist thinks about how close they were to the gold and what they missed. The bronze medalist is so grateful that they were good enough to get beyond where they were and get a medal. We should just be glad we get a medal. We should just be glad that we place. It's easy for us to be discouraged because we're not this, that, or the other. We placed because of the goodness of God. Chuck Colson talks about his hometown of Naples, Florida. It is a paradise for golfers. 30-plus golf, uh, golf courses, 
beautiful sandy beaches. And he says, you know, there's these really powerful men that come from the cities and they come down here and they build these beautiful castles, these mansions, and they play golf. And these guys that used to control so many things in the world had millions of dollars at their disposal. Before you know it, they're talking about how many rounds of golf they played that day, how many they were able to knock in, what their score was. And he goes, eventually they, for, they lose their shine, their, their passion, their purpose. And then they get a little dis, disoriented and say, well, I, wait a minute, I know what I need. I need a bigger house. So they build a bigger castle and they play more golf. And they change and they tweak their swing and they get a better golf score and they still end up in the same spot. And here's what he says at the end of that. He says, and when they get bored with that, they're miserable. The object of life is not what we think it is, which is to achieve money, power, and pleasure. That's not the Holy Grail. The object of life is maturing of the soul. I love that. The object of life is maturing of the soul. And you reflect that maturing of the soul when you care more for other people than you do for yourself. Loving God, loving your neighbor, loving others, that's the scorecard. The bigger castle won't satisfy. It's nice, but it won't satisfy. Proverbs 19.21 says this. Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. You know, I think this message is timely because it's a new year, it's a new decade, and we have all kinds of goals and things we're going to tweak and change, but have we aligned our life to his purpose If, you, if Jesus was sitting right here and you could ask him, you'd say, God, what's the most important thing? He says to love me with everything you have and then to love them. What if everybody asked him that question and then did that? How would this world be? Would it be different? Would you be different? Would I be different? Yes. It would be. You know, it's been said, and I think it's an interesting saying, ships are safe in the harbor, right? Ships weren't made to stay in the harbor. We're safe in the harbor, but we're not made to stay in the harbor. That's not our purpose. That's not why we were created. I'm going to read a, a statement here. It's on Cedar Creek. It says, our purpose, and it puts together several elements here. It says, Cedar Creek exists to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus. This will happen as we, we are a united body, overcome by the goodness of God, building his kingdom one life at a time. As individuals, we will try to live like Jesus, value both his grace and truth, seek authentic relationships with others, and serve beyond our own desires, pursuing transformation in partnership with the Holy Spirit. That is the mission, that is the vision, that is the core values of Cedar Creek. What would happen, church, if we just did that? What if we could just burn that paragraph on us? How, how, would, how would we be? How, how, would, how would our lives be different? How would other lives be different? You know, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Paul says this in verse 9. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. I love that. I'm going to read it again. He has saved us and called us to a holy life. Not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. See, in this world, we, we lift up the MVP, the most valuable player, the guy who knocks it out of the park, the guy who crushes it during this game or this series or, or this playoff. We love that most valuable player. But you know what? There's another MVP that we can be part of. In the business world, it's called the minimum viable product minimum viable product when something new comes to market they don't have all the bugs worked out but they have enough that it meets the needs of the customer 
and they build from there. Believer, you have enough to meet the needs of the customer. You have enough to love the Lord your God with all you have. You have enough to start to love your neighbors. You have the minimal viable product living within you if you have the Holy Spirit. We don't have to have it perfected. We don't have to have all the answers and know how to answer every question, but we do need to step in and say, you know what? I don't know it all, but I know this. I know this about Jesus. I know how my life is different. I know how loving him has changed things for me. And I hope that I'm better because of him. The whole duty of man is to bring glory to God and enjoy him forever. So what is our purpose, church? What is your purpose? What were you created to do? Not what you do Monday through Friday, but what has God created you to do? What are the things he has for you? What are the things that's there, the things that are there that you've, you don't want to be there? What are gifts you've been given that you don't want to step into? Mm, he might ask me to do this, and I don't feel comfortable with that, but I'm gifted in that. When we hold back, the kingdom doesn't grow like it should. When we are not overcome, we hold back and things don't work as well as they could and we get bored and we chase other shiny things. We go to build bigger houses and play more golf. But if we step into what God has called us to do, I think it makes the difference. And here's the thing, only you know that, only I know that. I, I hope the Holy Spirit is stirring within you. Sometimes it gets harder to pretend what we don't know, doesn't it? I'm called to this. I should say this. I should. There's some stirring within me, but I don't want to step into it. I don't want to put myself out there. This is comfortable here. I like it this way. It's predictable. What if we lived, sold out, overcome, Holy Spirit led, unpredictable lives? What would change? How would your life change? Do you love God with all you have? You, you know that answer, I don't. He does, and you do. Are you sold out enough to God? Am I sold out enough to God to love my neighbor as myself? Sometimes I don't even know who my neighbors are. What would happen if, if we stepped into the purpose God has for us? So as we kind of reset for the year, we looked at the mission, we looked at the vision, we looked at these things that go up on the wall, but now we're looking at things that happen down the halls of our workplaces, of our schools, of our homes. What is your purpose? You know, God knows. It's what you're created to do to bring him glory and to enjoy him forever so church as we stand and we sing I hope that this series has not just been something that to kick off the year because well it's church time and we always have a vision Sunday and we kick off a new series I, want, I don't want that to be us I want us to be changed from the inside out and to have a passion and a fire and a purpose that's beyond Sunday morning. I want that for me. I, I want that for you. The church has more power than we use. The church has more power than we step into. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's who we're called to follow. There is no... There is no greater master. There is no higher calling. There is no better king. There is no better option. He's it. Love him. Love his people. Be sold out to him. Let's stand and sing. i
to what the Holy Spirit has given you today on what your purpose is, where you fit, how to love Him, how to love His people, how to get behind yourself and let Him take first place. It's easy for us to get in the way, isn't it? I, I love Jesus, but I, as long as He's right behind me, as long as my stuff happened first, I'm all about the kingdom after my stuff's taken care of. That's part of the human condition. That's how we're wired. So I'm gonna pray for us to, as we leave this place, but if today you're not sure what this means, so what do I do with this? Is Jesus really who he says he is? Can I really believe what Greg said? Can I believe what people around me are saying? 
The answer is yes. So if you don't know Jesus today, talk to someone around you. They can, if they can't tell you how to take your next step with Christ, come and find me. I'm pretty sure they can help you, but if they can't, we'll get together and do that. But right now I have some friends I want to have come forward. It's uh, Andrew and Jordan Stump. They have been visiting us for quite a while. And uh, we've talked about this. And they're like, you know what? I think we want to call Cedar Creek home and we want to grow and we want to serve with these fine folks. Yeah, amen. <laughs> this, this one's Andrew. <laughs> this one's short. And uh, she's really glad to be up here, I know. We talked about this this morning. They look pretty safe, though, don't they? It's a pretty safe bunch. I know you guys are immersed believers and you love the Lord, but I just want to ask, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the one that we should follow, and the one you want to spend your days here serving? Yes. yes. All right, so we have a new brother and sister worshiping with us, and they want to call Cedar Creek home. <laughs> So, you, anything you want to say, brother? Nope. Here, here's the thing. I, I'm going to pray, but I want you guys to, if you don't know him, come up and say hi. That's part of being the body of Christ. That's part of getting to know each other and being on this journey together. So I'm going to pray and we're going to be dismissed, but make sure you stop and say hi. And they have a little girl and a little boy too that uh, you probably ought to get to know as well. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful. We are grateful for the purposes you have for us. Lord, we're so grateful that Jesus followed through with the purpose you had for him. Father, even in the garden and other places, he just didn't want to, but it was your will, Father, that he was pursuing over his own. Lord, help us to be that way as well. For Andrew and Jordan, we celebrate and we rejoice with them as they say, yes, let's be part of this family here. They're part of the big church, but they want to be part of the little sea here at Cedar Creek and serve and worship and grow and fill their purpose here. Again, Lord, you are good to us and we are grateful. Thank you for the Father who creates, for the Son who saves, and the Holy Spirit who comforts and guides today. Lord, thank you for your amazing grace. And thank you, Lord, as always, for loving us first. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. You're dismissed. Make sure you stop and see these folks.